Please be seated. I noticed that, well, Diane, but prior to that, no one sat in the front row here. Or in the second row. You guys afraid of me now? If you weren't here last week, there was a little bit of a shattering experience up front here. Um, we, we, we broke a mirror and, and some people in the front row were, I guess, not willing to sit in the front row again. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, so who watched the Super Bowl last week? Yes. Uh, who watched the commercials? Did anybody have a favorite commercial? Dodge. Dodge? Me too. <laughs> Anyone else? Budweiser. Budweiser, Budweiser the Clydesdale. Budweiser. My favorite commercial was the Dodge commercial, the farmer commercial. I don't know if you've seen this commercial, if you didn't see it during the Super Bowl this week. And it just starts out with the voice of Paul Harvey. Uh, and it's just uh, Paul Harvey talking about uh, God made a farmer. It's a, it's a poem that he gave in the mid-70s. And the, uh, the, the commercial starts with just a picture of a, uh, of a snowy farm. And then it goes through pictures of, of farmers and, and farms. Um, and uh, it was, it's a powerful commercial. Well, the voice of Paul Harvey is powerful uh, itself. It, uh, we were um, in a party, and it just kind of stopped everybody. And everyone just turned. They, once they heard the voice of Paul Harvey, they just turned to the television. It was a very powerful commercial. But, but to me, I think what was so powerful about it was that it was so simple. I think there's brilliance in beauty and simplicity. There was no video. It wasn't a video, it was just, it was a slideshow of pictures. There was no background music. It was just the voice of Paul Harvey. Uh, I mean, when you compare it to the other commercials, you know, the, the, the Got Milk commercial where the rock is going around and things are exploding and he's able to save all these people because he's drinking milk. And, you know, we live in a world where we can do all these things now uh, with, with computer-generated graphics and all this stuff, and so we just throw as much as we can into everything. And this commercial was, we're just going to, Make it really simple. It's just going to be a slideshow. I mean, literally, we could probably make that commercial here in about two hours. Just putting together, grabbing pictures, making it stuff. And to me, that was beautiful the way they did that. It reminded me, I don't know, I'm sure you've all heard of the name Johnny Cash. Uh, uh, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, this man who had this great career in, in rock and roll and country uh, and, and all these albums that he had done with this big band and, uh, uh, and all these background singers and towards the late 80s, early 90s, his career was kind of winding down and there was a record producer who said, his name was Rick Rubin, he said, John, why don't we just record you sitting in your living room with an acoustic guitar? Just you and your guitar. Okay, I could do that. And he won a Grammy. And a whole new generation fell in love with Johnny Cash. And it was just because he, he took what he had done and he just simplified it. It's just me, my Martin acoustic guitar, and my voice, and that's it. There's beauty and simplicity. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get to in his letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthians were a, a church that, that, that got started. Uh, Paul had helped them get started. And then Paul went away, and then they started saying, well, if you have these gifts, you're better than the people with these gifts. So if you have the gift of preaching or speaking in tongues, you're up here. But if you have the gift of, like, teaching or, uh, you know, if you have the gift of janitorial services, you're just not as special as these other people. They were overthinking church. And Paul said, let me remind you what I told you while I was there. This is of most importance. This is of first importance. That Jesus died for your sins. That Jesus was buried. And that Jesus came back to life. And because of that, you're saved. I think our church today... could really listen to the message of Paul, could really learn from keeping things simple, from the beauty of simplicity. I don't, I've, I've been sad in the last couple days, last week or so. Um, 
First of all, I think if we keep our message simple, we have a, a message that's more universal. Within, within Christian churches, have you seen the, uh, the report about the Lutheran church, or the, the LCMS pastor, Missouri Center Lutheran pastor in Newtown, who had to apologize for being part of an interfaith service? Uh, I think when we start to take ourselves too seriously, when we start to think we have all the answers, we say things on behalf of God that I don't think God would agree with. And so we say things like, our pastors should not be part of interfaith services in a town where there was a mass murder in one of our schools. And then the news grabs it, and the whole world sees it and thinks, wow, I don't think I want anything to do with Lutherans. Doesn't matter, Missouri Senate, ELCA, Wisconsin, I don't want anything to do with Lutherans. I think we need to be very careful when we think we're talking for God and when we're saying more than just a simple, beautiful message. Because pe the people that aren't in church today, they're not in church because we hear this message of Jesus died for your sins, he loves you so much, and then he came back to life and you're saved. They didn't hear that message and go, nah, I don't want to get up and go to church. You know what they heard? They heard, God really doesn't like gay people. God really doesn't like people who live together before they're married. God really doesn't like a lot of people. And we as Christians don't want those type of people in our church. And so they hear that and say, no, I'm just not really interested in that. If we just kept to the basics, the simple part of this beautiful religion that we have, this beautiful relationship with God that we have, God loves you so much. He came here. He died for your sins. He was buried. But death couldn't hold him. And he came back to life. And we're all saved. If we could just stick to that, if we could just stick to the basics of the religion, that would be a beautiful thing. And I think people would love to hear that instead of all the other stuff. So it's universal. And it's easy. If we stick to this basic message of the salvation of God through Jesus, it's easy for us to talk to people about God. It's easy for us to share this message because it's simple. Jesus died for your sins because he loves you. He was buried, he came back to life, he defeated death, and you're saved because of it. We don't have to go deeper than that. Now, this is what I don't want you to hear. This is what I don't want you to hear. I don't want you to hear that uh, because of that, you shouldn't go home and try and understand God in a deeper way. I don't want you to hear that. Because our first pillar of who we are as a church is that we grow in faith. But what I want you to hear this is I want you to grow in your faith, but I want you to go into an understanding that you're never going to understand. You're never going to get it. You're never going to fully understand God because God is so much bigger than you could ever get. Does that make sense? I want you to journey towards a deeper faith. But I think the place to start is not trying to understand God better. It's trying to understand yourself better. It's this moment that Peter has in the gospel lesson today where he brings in all these fish. You know, Peter is a fisherman. He knows how to fish. Jesus is not. And so Jesus says, drop down your nets. He's like, we've been fishing all night. We're going to drop down our nets and we're not going to get in. We're not going to get anything. Jesus says, just trust me. Okay, we'll drop down our nets. So they drop down their nets and they get all these fish. And what does he do? He drops to his knees. It says, stay away from me, Jesus. I am a sinner. Stay away from me. I am a sinner. Jesus said, stand up and follow me. It is for you whom I come. I think we need to understand ourselves. And I think that's what Lent is all about. We start Lent on Wednesday. Paul says Jesus died for our sins. What are our sins? What are the habits we have? What are the things we say, the things we do that, that make us sinful people? If we can go deeper into understanding ourselves, we can understand the love of God in a deeper way. But, wow, I'm really not worthy of being loved. And the more I understand that, the more I understand God's love, the more I understand God's grace. 
Even you at your best is not good enough. But I love you at your worst. That is what it means to grow in faith, to understand that God. And so when we have that conversation with people about God who loves you so much that he died for your sins, we can really say, and here are my sins. Here are the things that I do that God has forgiven me for. That's powerful. So when, when we keep it simple, we're more universal. When we keep it simple, it's easier to talk to people about. And those are nice. And I, and I really want you to think about those. But this is the most important thing I'm going to say today. I was at peer ministry yesterday up at Briarwood. Uh, we have four, four of our youth are up at Briarwood right now being trained to be peer ministers. Uh, and they're going to be deployed on their schools to help, help the kids that they go to school with. It's a great thing. And uh, I was up there and I spent the morning with them. And I ran into a guy named Tom Schwalbert. I don't know if you know the name Tom Schwalbert. He is the father of a young man named Max Schwalbert who... Um, on Christmas vacation, they were driving up to Wisconsin, and Max got the flu. And uh, four days later, Max was dead. He was a high school senior at Marcus, and you might have seen it was on the news around here. It was on CNN, just this huge outpouring of love for this family. Um, and it's the first time I've seen Tom since then. I just came up and gave him a really big hug, and we started talking about, you know, how are you doing, what, what's going on? And, uh, and then he said, the first couple of weeks were okay, because we were surrounded by so many people. But then as life starts, you start living into this new reality. And I come home at night from work. And I get home and I'm waiting for him to come home from school. He doesn't come home. And I just don't think I'll really ever get over it. But I'm okay. Because of my faith. I don't understand how anybody can get through something like this without faith. When our life ends, when the life of a loved one ends, when we are in the darkest moments of our life, all we have is that simple message. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again because death could not hold him. And because of that, we are all saved. That's all we have. That's all he has to hold on to right now is knowing that when I die, I will see my son again. He's waiting there for me to come home. This message is all we have. This basic, simple message of salvation. That was all we need.